beautiful cities. We dream of a society that is fair and just, in which people are genuinely treated as equals, where our children can grow and find a place and be strong and bring their gifts, develop their gifts, and live that life that we long for them. As we dream of cities of this kind, as we dream Newham in this way, we imagine a society, a city that is resilient, that can withstand all kinds of challenges and learn from those challenges. But each time we find a word like resilient, sometimes we use it and we use it and we use it and in the end the meaning is somehow lost. So right now, for each of you, if you were for a moment, tracking back over your life, times when you've had your back against the wall, when you felt defeated, when you were in some way so challenged that you weren't sure that you could make it, if you would just hold that moment in your imagination. And then for that further moment, to dwell on what it was that you called upon within yourself or from your family, your friends, your community, that somehow resourced you to find your way through to a better time. In these memories, we understand what resilience is. Now, each of the speakers was invited to bring a symbol that for them spoke of resilience. And this is a little yew tree a yew tree that was growing in the valley where I live on the edge of Dartmoor in the southwest of England. And I've dug it up and put it in this pot and after this event, when I go home again, I'll replant it back into that wood. These trees are remarkable. There are specimens alive today in Britain that are reckoned to be at least 1,000 years old. Estimates agree something probably in the region of 2,000 years old, and it is possible they grow to three, four, five thousand years old. Yew trees have always been associated with the land, the people, our ancestors, and an ancient, ancient religion. Yew trees were a refuge for some of the freedom fighters that existed in this land 2,000 years ago when Rome was on our shores and invading. And two of those freedom fighters, chieftains of tribes that used to occupy this land, took their lives using the poison that yew trees provide. At the same time, these little trees, that, well, this little tree, but the bigger trees that they become, are extraordinary have an extraordinary capacity to renew themselves. So unlike most other trees, if they break and a branch falls and the, bar and the trunk tears, they can withstand infection and grow through that and renew themselves and, and become healthy again, hence the ability to live for so, so long. And the other thing is, it's from these trees that the longbows were made. The longbows that were used in the Hundred Years' War here in Britain against France and places. But those bows are significant, not because particularly in my mind about that war, but they did something else which was extraordinary. They empowered ordinary people in a way that we had never been empowered before, and that is why you will not find a yew bow or a long bow of any kind on a coat of arms because the aristocracy, the lords and ladies hated the long bow because the long bow gave power to the people. The oldest long bow found in our country is 4,000 years old in Dumfries. These trees tell a story of resilience and power to people.
Now maybe there are some of us who are innocent and blameless for the very difficult predicaments we find ourselves in. I am not one of those. I could not possibly claim to be either innocent or blameless in most of the incidents that have happened in my life. The expression, digging a hole for yourself, is one I, th I guess we know. He's, he's digging a hole for himself with that activity, whatever it is. But I'd like to share with you a, a story, an incident that happened to me which involved the digging of a hole and a rather unpleasant uh, outcome. I love digging holes. I don't dig so many holes now that I used to leave, dig when I was younger, but powerful in my younger days physically, I could dig a hole like nobody else. I was very proud of those holes as well because they had purely vertical sides, maybe very precise, very neat, circular or square, and just like a shaft, just dropping straight down into the ground. Now, at my place, Embercombe, before we got our compost toilets, as we took the step towards becoming more sustainable, we needed to dig a number of toilet latrines. Now, this is different. This is just a hole in the ground with a little shed over the top. And then you sit above that, you do your business, and gradually the hole fills up. Obviously, there's some people that avoid these places the best they possibly can, but search for the flushing toilet. But the, the hole fills up, and at that point, you cover over the hole, and then you move the shed to another hole that you've dug. You pop the shed on there, and then that one fills up. It's not a good way to carry on, and hence, this was an interim measure. So I had dug this perfectly deep hole, and it was about that deep. And then we moved the shed and put the shed on top, and it was used over about a three-month period. And lots of people came, and all of them left an offering. <laughs> and gradually, the hole filled up. It got to the point where it was at capacity, that if you used it anymore, you'd get splashback, which was very unpleasant. <laughs> and so we moved the shed, and I was in charge of moving this to the new site. So I'd spent a lot of time digging the new hole, and now we had to get eight people to lift the shed, it's quite heavy, bring it across and put it down. We lifted the first shed off, and looking at this hole, now this hole had been there cooking over three months in the summer. I don't want to dwell on this point, but you understand what I'm saying. It was, it was potent. So. I saw these corrugated iron sheets, and I said, OK, before we do anything else, put these corrugated iron sheets down on top so that the worst does not happen. And so we put the corrugated iron sheets down. Now, I can't remember. I think we went for a cup of tea, and a few things happened. And I am 64 years old, so perhaps I have some reason for this lapse, this kind of sudden memory loss that I occurred and led to such a difficult situation. When we came back down, we started lifting this building. And there were a lot of other people all around watching and supervising, helping out. And I suddenly thought, this is dangerous. And I noticed these corrugated iron sheets there. And I bent down. I said, hold on, stop. I bent down. I grabbed the corrugated iron sheets. I whooshed them ahead, and I stepped forward. Now we'll freeze time. <laughs> As I'm telling you the story, you could, you could dwell on maybe your own version of this incident. Some appalling situation, partially, if not wholly, self-created. And you take that step, and you know all hope is lost. <laughs> there was that moment I just knew. I thought, my goodness, that's it. I'm going down. <laughs> there was, I could see a ring of faces around me, just horror <laughs> writ on their faces. I knew how whole deep the hole was. I felt terror just rush through me. I cannot think of anything else that I would rather not happen to me. 
and suddenly, in vertical mode, I'm shooting downwards. Down, 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 down. <laughs> Something amazing happened. You've heard of levitation. I received some kind of divine ray must have hit me because I just shot vertically. It's just straight levitated my way out of this hole. I arose like the phoenix out of the fire, just emerging just like this symbol of, of uh, catastrophe, but perhaps redemption. Just, I just found myself shooting vertically back upwards and just arrived on the side, covered, and looking at my, all my people. Now, I'm the founder of this place. <laughs> my dignity is important. I represent something to my people. I felt at that moment like just falling to pieces, like just blubbing, weeping, shouting, railing against the gods, and I knew and in this moment, it was really important how I responded. And as I looked and I saw the ring of faces around me, I knew that they had a desperate desire to laugh. <laughs> but they weren't sure if that was OK. And it was the kind of laughter that you have when, when, you, when you, you just don't know what else to do. It's so horrible. And I knew at that moment there was a choice for me. And I burst out laughing. I tore my clothes off. I was stood naked there in that field. And they were just, they were on the floor, helpless with laughter, <laughs> looking at me. And it suddenly occurred to me, I can make more of this. So I grabbed my filthy clothes and I started running at them, whirling it around my head. <laughs> I chased them all around the field. And suddenly their laughter turned to, ah, and then run, run, run. And from this awful situation, and I, believe me, it was awful, suddenly there was joy, there was happiness, there was fun, and everything was lighter. And the last they saw of me, I was just running across the fields, the 500 yards back to my cottage, where I turned on the shower and remained for a very long time. <laughs> we have to be prepared for very difficult times, in my opinion. If we're not aware of that, then we must choose very selectively what we read, what we research, what we, the conversations we have, the friends we keep. There can be very little doubt in my mind to anyone that makes it their business to be informed that we are riding our way deeper and deeper into a storm. And within that storm are all kinds of possibility, beautiful and wonderful possibility. But we, our courage will be called for. There is... In, in my view, I guess, the, the, one of the greatest challenges that we face is that we're, so many of us are committed bystanders. We just stand on the edge and watch, but we do not imagine that we actually are responsible and should step forward and contribute and participate. Yet that is what we're called to do. So if we were to take a story that has also been made into a film. We take Lord of the Rings, for instance. We take Lord of the Rings. I'm hoping that many of you will have either seen the film or read the book, but even if you haven't, towards the end of the film, our, our band of heroes has arrived at this place called Helm's Deep. Now, Helm's Deep is an impregnable fortress and marching against Helm's Deep are untold thousands, if not millions, looking at the movie, of orcs coming forward 
and goblins and goodness knows what <laughs> marching towards Helm's Deep. And inside is this little band of warriors and there's shots of light, you know, women holding a little baby and the baby's sobbing and, and, and men looking defeated and broken and helpless and hopeless and it's not a good vibe, it doesn't feel very good. And the orcs, meanwhile, <laughs> and they look huge and they're really mean looking folk and they're heading towards Helm's Deep. However, the king says, ah, don't worry, Helm's Deep has, main, has withstood every invasion, uh, uh, every attack that's ever happened in all of history. It's okay. At that point, there's a crunch and an explosion, and they break through underneath the wall, and suddenly they're entering. So there is no hope. There is no hope. They're just coming in. So now the sniveling and the whining and the, oh no, you know, Nasty goblins is all building up. And our little group of heroes are there. Gimli, the dwarf, Legolas, the elf, Aragorn. So what do we do? If at that point Aragorn had pulled the little shutter on the door, looked out, saw millions of heavily armed orcs, closed it, looked at his little band of people that numbered something like seven and said, okay, Gimli, you're a very good fighter and you've been practicing a lot. Legolas, you can shoot like, I don't know, how many arrows in a minute? Uh, I reckon if we fight really hard, we might be able to do it. They would have just looked at him like, you know, he's completely lost his mind. It's hopeless, completely hopeless. So what does he say? He doesn't say that. He just says, fling open the doors and we'll ride out. And it's with joy in our hearts that we just ride into this challenge. So happy, so deeply privileged that we are alive at this time and have gifts that we can bring. Hope, open the door. Hurl open that door and we step forward into this time just saying, I am alive now. The end of the chapter I have not read yet. But I go out joyful, sure in myself, so deeply happy that I'm alive at a time when it really matters, the choices that I make, my deep resilience. And the curious thing is that when we act in that way, we create the best possible outcome, likelihood, the best possible likelihood for the outcome that we're not dependent on, that we're not focused on, we're just in the now. That by acting that way, we do create the, that opportunity for magic. And in the film, of course, boom, and over the top comes Gandalf, and the situation is saved. But even what if it wasn't? We will all die at some point. The knowledge that during your life you lived the fullest, most honorable, true, powerful, joyful, alive life that you possibly could to the needs of the people, to the needs of our wider ecology, to the needs of our earth, would you not die feeling pretty good about yourself? here in Newham is just one of those places where that magic can happen and where resilience does live. Thank you.